Jack Kavanagh, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here on the Modern Warrior podcast and uh, what a warrior you are. Um, having overcome incredible adversity in your life, you are a man who brings so much inspiration and hope to others, including myself. And to start with and to give all the listeners a bit of context in terms of what exactly I'm talking about, can you bring us back to 2012? Yeah, certainly. Well, the first thing I'll say is, look, it's a, a pleasure to be with you here today. And um, to everyone who's listening, hello and, and welcome on the journey. Um, so look, as you alluded to, there was kind of a moment in my life that marks a before and an after, you know, and I think we all kind of have those sliding doors moments in our lives. But I think the context of before is really important because... I was just coming out of my teenage years, um, really grappled as a young person with dyslexia and um, had developed some good strategies to work around that. And I became quite diligent as a teenager then. And we would talk about now, you know, a, a strategy for managing health and well-being. And, but like sports was my stress reliever um, because, you know, the dyslexia was a challenge um, in my life and something that that was stressful for me and um, and so sports became my, my relief mechanism and as I went through my teenage years I started to develop like quite a healthy relationship between you know really applying myself and getting reward and, and sort of self-respect from that um, and and then after school I'd lace up the runners and and one foot would go in front of the other or I'd be on the rugby pitch but my ultimate passion was was water sports and it's funny, like growing up in County Meath, like you'd wonder how that happened. But um, surfing, windsurfing, sailing, any time I could get near the water, I exploring along the coast, that was where I wanted to be. And I trained as a lifeguard and as a windsurfing and, and surfing instructor. And I'd spent my summers um, from my later teenage years um, down the west of Ireland in a place called Belmullet, um, working in an Irish college down there as an instructor. And this place was just magic to me, you know, like... The ruggedness of the west of Ireland, the the that was the place to go for big waves to 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 surf um for for good wind to to get out in the water regularly, um for hills to run in for cliffs to jump off and and caves to explore and I was just in my element here, um in in this place like and at that time and I felt like I'd really found my people, um because you get a certain cohort that go to a place like that, um. And life was good. And I think it's really important that I acknowledge, like I got to this place, like, yes, as a teenager, all the bloody questions we have, you know, your, your wandering body of emotions and hormones and you have every question for yourself and do you fit in and um, does that matter, body image, all these kind of things come up and, and, and I went through all of those things as well. But at that stage of my life, just finished my first year studying pharmacy in college and I went back down to West Ireland and had an amazing summer. Um, and at the end of that summer, I went away on a holiday with seven of my best mates. Um, and on the first day I got up and I went for a run as I'd done so many times. Um, found this beautiful beach in Portugal um, that in Albafira that we spent the rest of the afternoon on. Just catching up with each other. We'd all had different jobs for the summer and we were coming together to, to spend some time and um, I decided to go for one more swim before dinner and I ran down the beach, dived into the water over a wave and I just didn't anticipate how shallow it was and my head collided with the sandbank and in that moment I fractured and dislocated the fifth vertebrae down in my neck and there was like a click and a little bit of heat and it was almost like a zap of electricity just leaving from the center of my body towards my extremities and my body just went limp and I look it's strange like I think any person that has ever had a, a near miss in their life or seen a child run towards a road or um, been on the bike when a car zips just and barely misses you you'll know that in an experience like that time kind of slows down 
And there's a really good neurobiological reason why that is. It's, you know, you're essentially your body um, and your mind recognize I'm under threat here. This is a dangerous situation. Situation. I need to learn from what's happening here so that I don't let this repeat, you know. And um, and so time slows down a little bit and you take in a lot more information. And I remember time slowing down and being completely aware of what had happened, knowing I was face down in the water, realizing I couldn't move. Um, the irony of the situation hitting me that I was the best trained of all the lads to deal with this and I was the one in the water. Um, thinking about my parents at home, my two younger sisters, uh, my girlfriend at the time and the dinner we had organized for the end of the week. I wondered would the lads get to me in time and if they didn't, how would they deal with that? And and I knew that I'd run out of oxygen and that what would happen next would be that I'd breathe in water. And, and that's exactly what happened. But luckily, Stephen got to me before, um, before I blacked out. Um, and the following day, I woke up in intensive care and my head was in a cage. I had to call it traction. So I had um, a halo brace around my head with weights hanging off the back of it, trying to straighten out my spine. Um, before the surgery, I had tubes in my nose um, called a nasogastric tube that was feeding me and keeping me hydrated and one down my throat um, that that I realized was a ventilator, you know, so I was fully ventilated. And, and that was the first of 28 days in intensive care. It was air ambulanced home after two weeks and I spent another two weeks in intensive care in Ireland, nearly didn't make it. And um, then 28 days in high dependency. 49 days fully ventilator dependent um, and eventually got to rehab where I spent 196 days and I was literally like a child. Um, I was completely dependent on the people around me for almost everything. Um, but as time went on, you get a bit of clarity about the situation and the reality was is that I I had about 15% muscle function remaining. So that's my shoulders, my biceps and my wrists. I don't have any finger function or movement below my armpits. And the last, it's incredible, like it's 11 years now, which is crazy. Um, but the last 11 years has been um, a real journey of, um, certainly a mental and emotional journey, but it's been a journey of um, challenging all the you will nevers that you're told in the months um, after an injury like I sustained, challenging the expectations of the quality of life and the health that someone can can aspire to or can live with um, following an injury like mine. Um, and also um, maybe taking charge of the narrative when it's so easy for that to be taken away from you. When there's so many, particularly in the early days, professionals putting their expectations and the standard um, diagnosis or outcome um, onto your story um, and really seeking to take charge of that and possibly the best way of describing the, the fundamental um, um, two places that that you could live in after an injury like mine is is it's almost perfectly summarized in this story that happened while I was waking up in intensive care. And my parents were on a flight over to Portugal, not quite sure what they'd find when they arrived, but actually knowing that I'd had this bad injury. And my mum asked a question that's really understandable, and it's a version of a question we've all asked. And she says, why Jack? Why would this happen to Jack? And I definitely asked that question too. And it was a really important question for me to ask. You know, it, asking that question allowed me to feel lots of the tough emotions to face the reality of, you know, this was not what I expected at the age of, I just turned 20. Um, this is so far outside the realms of any possibility for my life that I imagined. Um, and to feel the grief and the upset. And the grief journey was so important for me because, you know, you've got the anger and the, the shock and the denial, the anger and the bargaining. And then at a certain point, you hit the dip or the depression. And it's a natural response to a really challenging thing that's happened. And like, 
we all have moments where we ask why me it could be a breakup a financial challenge losing a job not getting a job and um, you know it could be any number of things a health scare um or a freak injury like i sustained and um and yet and i hit the dip in particularly at different stages but particularly after leaving rehab um because that was the real conf- confronting period of, wow, I'm out of hospital and this is still the circumstance. And that was very, a very big thing to comprehend. And um, going from being such an independent, outgoing young person to being so reliant in those early days and having nothing figured out. But the thing about grief is like, it's messy, you know, it, it doesn't happen in stage by stage, you know, and um, there's a great phrase I heard a few years ago, different levels, different devils, you know, as you heal one layer of it, the next one emerges a little while later and, and you confront that. And um, and after you come through the dip and it's hard to see how long that takes, um, then you come through the, the reconstruction phase and you're reimagining what your life can look like after this hard thing has happened and what the future will look like again and 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 at some point you get to you know acceptance and hope for the future and and several things happen i think during that process and the first half of it is you're basically asking why me you know and it's a shit thing that's happened um it's a, it's allowing yourself to be the victim yeah i, th- I think that's something struck me um, during your own process and it's something that I feel is often being bastardized in some way these days in terms of don't play the victim. Victimhood leaves you in a, a powerless situation where you feel like you have no control and you're blaming others, you're blaming life, you're blaming people around you. But at the same time, there is a necessity to be with that for a period of time. Would you agree? Yeah, and it's not necessarily like this was... A- a really tough event that happened but like the hard thing for me was there was there was no one to blame and it was just this freak thing and so like it would have been really nice to have like someone to point the finger at but would that have helped no um ultimately you, you, no. you didn't point the finger at yourself at any stage in terms of <laughs> why should i have known you know all of these those kind of, of questions yeah the if and the but but ultimately at a certain point, you realize that takes you nowhere. You go through all of it, but it yeah. it takes you nowhere. And so the thing is, is as important as entertaining that why me question is like, if you, if you stay there, you become the victim. Do, do you think you need to be there for a period of time though? It's really So important. you can get beyond it? It's really important because you're doing yourself fundamental disservice. It, I often equate it to like, if you don't allow yourself after a tough thing happens to feel the tough emotions, like you're not living in reality. <laughs> and, and that comes back to you, bite you at a certain point. It's almost like pushing um, a, a football down in a swimming pool. And the further you push it down, the greater the pressure increases. And it's going to get away from you at some point. And when it does, the further you've pushed that down, which is the emotions and the denial of the reality, the further it's going to bounce out of the water and it'll go flying off and it'll hit or hurt someone close to you or whatever it is, but it'll come out in a way that you didn't intend it to. Yeah, you lose control. Exactly. And so on the plane that day, though, my dad responded to my mum in a way that that is kind of remarkable um, at that at that stage. And she was entertaining, why Jack? Why would this happen to Jack? And dad responded... And he said, well, why not, Jack? Why should this have happened to anyone else on the beach? Um, And in the months and years after the injury, I read a lot of Stoicism and Buddhism. And and there's there's threads of that Buddhism and and Stoic approaches within that response. But it um, it was a pretty profound thing to respond with. And I only learned about that conversation a few years later. And I always joke like that. The first thing I said to dad when I heard that story was, well, cheers, dad, yeah, you know, yeah. but, um, but he was dead right. And, and I found 
after a couple of months of engaging, you know, this, this why me, you can be holding two different things at the same time in your experience. And there'd be days when, when I'd be in the why me, and then you'd, you'd get your energy back and you'd say, no, I have a choice here. Um, and at a certain point I started to engage the why not me or realizing I had a choice and, and how I responded was going to be really important. And like, as I was going through the dip, I realized that it was important that I'd have something in the future that was compelling to me that I would move towards because, because otherwise you just end up wandering aimlessly. And I just knew that I wanted to be back in the college environment. That's what I had been doing and I wanted to get back onto that path in some way. And the reason was, is I'd be surrounded by peers. I would be challenged intellectually. I'd be um, out and in the city. I'd be um, uh, challenged to live independently. And like at the time when I decided this, I was learning to breathe again. Like there's a, a stretch goal and then there's a stretch goal, you know? And, um, um, but to me, that was an inspiring thing. And I do think it's important that like there's things in the future that are inspiring to us because it pulls more out of us in the present. And the word inspire medically means to breathe in. And so like that's nearly the thing that gives you the oxygen to keep going on the tough days. And for me, that was to get back to college. And, you know, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have had the reason over the next couple of months. Yes, I was going through the dip, but I was also making progress in little ways. And I wouldn't have had the impetus to do all of the little things that added up. Yes, I got back there and I was still way outside my comfort zone and I needed so much support and I had nothing figured out, but I was a lot further along the journey than I otherwise would have been. And the next couple of years, from my perspective, looked so messy and I was trying to reclaim the tiniest minutia of independence bit by bit and gradually reducing the level of support that I, I needed and all these bits and pieces. But to the outside world, it looked like Jack's back, you know, and 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 if only they knew just how much peddling there was going on under, under the surface, you know. Um, but that distinction of the, the why me to the why not me became really powerful because, you know, I was engaged with, how tough this was and how unplanned this was. And, you know, I didn't want these choices when I was 20, but realizing I had choices was really important. And the choices were to say, not just in the bigger moments, but the smaller moments, like yes or no, I can or I can't try again or give up. Um, and all of those things became really important because, you know, if you choose to say yes, I can or to try again, 51% of the time you're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Like you have to remember you're a human being as well and not a robot. Like, but if you do it 51% of the time, you start to build momentum over mm -hmm. time. And, and that became powerful to me. And, and it's kind of translated to everything over the last number of years. We kept asking why not me in different ways and what would happen if in a constructive form, you know, and that's really important because stories are sticky and there's narratives that we choose to believe and buy into are really important. And, and, and so I just kept asking, well, why not me? And how can I, mm -hmm. and you know, if we did this together and, and, and started taking that lens and, and it's been quite transformative and it doesn't mean that I don't slip every now and then but it helps me to get back on track when I do. Mm -hmm. Th that moment where you felt the, the click, as you call it, in the, in the ocean was like a, a switch going off in your life, perhaps, in terms of switching off your life as you knew it, but then at the same time switching on this, this new life that you're now going to live. Mm. And you lost a lot of power and physically. Um, but as that switch was turned back on again, what do you feel like you've gained yeah. from that experience? It's really interesting. Some, someone asked me once, um, like, if you had a magic wand and you could go back, would you change it? And I had to think about it. And I don't think you would. 
Well, I certainly don't think I would. Um, like I've gained so much over the years. It's been hard. Like I wouldn't deny that it's been hard and like I don't get a day off and from having a spinal injury and there's stuff that I just have to entertain every day that comes with that um but what have I gained like I've the people that I've met along the way and the way that I've been able to engage with them um is certainly on a different level than maybe otherwise would have experienced the places I've gone um and the experiences um, that I've I've had as a result of this, I think it's opened my eyes to, um, although I kind of resisted this at the initial stages, it's opened my eyes to um, a whole cohort of society. You know, like disability is often thing, thought of as as a dirty word, but like all of our abilities change over time, and especially as we age. Like I've always been into health and fitness, and it's been a journey to get back on that path and and I intend to age as well as I possibly can but our 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 functional capacity and our intellectual or or cognitive capacities change over time you know there's periods where we have like a broken arm or a broken leg and um um as much as like an illness or whatever it is and and it kind of opened my eyes to this whole cohort of society that um just how remarkable and adaptable and innovative we are as people and you know the, the history of humanity is that we're adaptable to changing circumstances and the incredible resilience that we all have yeah, yeah. and it doesn't get spoken about like people um often ask me to to come in uh, to places and speak about resilience and i'm like you're already that you know yeah um like i think i've, I've learned so much over the years but it's what it's encouraged me to do is you know, you could stay hurt or you can try to heal. And um, and as I've gone on that sort of exploration of how do I manage this experience that I'm going through in a healthy way or as healthy a way as I can, um, how do I express the frustrations and, and so on in ways that are constructive rather than destructive for me and the people around me? All of these things have kind of pushed me to learn and to explore areas that I, who knows, would I have ever got there before and gone there um, had this not happened. And there's an amazing book, I don't know if you've heard of it, um, called The Midnight Library by uh, Ma- uh, Matt Haig. I haven't come across that one yet. No, I know of Matt Haig though, yeah. but And and so The Midnight Library is about this, this um, lady who um, is depressed and um, she goes back and gets to live all the other lives that she could have lived if she made different decisions at different points. And she comes to, at the end of the book, I won't spoil it, but like she comes to this realization that maybe she wouldn't live, have chosen any of those other lives. And like in some of those lives, she's like an Olympic champion or she's like a famous TV personality. And like everybody has their shit. It's just boxed in different ways. And like, everybody's experience has challenges with it um, and and it's just like the heartbeat it's full of the highs and lows as we go through life and so like who knows if if I had that magic wand um you know when I went back and I I didn't dive in that day my life m- might not have been for the better mm-hmm. just in different circumstances um and and so maybe it's not so much about circumstances but what you make of them and 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 I certainly have met incredible people and and learned a lot about myself and hopefully um been able to translate some of that to to give something back to others do you think you already had all this instilled before the accident happened in terms of this level of resilience and grit and determination because it takes all of those things and much more to be able to get to this point today and what do you feel influenced those type of characteristics and behaviors in you over the years prior to the accident um i would say that like as a teenager or a young person as a kid, like I was like really innovative 
and creative kind of kid. Um, so I, I'll tell you a story, actually. I, I um, When I was about eight or nine, um, I used to make these peg <coughs> guns and we had this uh, this kind of bamboo type tree in the back garden and I'd go out with the little saw and I'd hacksaw off a couple of the branches and I'd chisel out and I'd take a peg off the, the clothesline and, and cut a groove out of it and tape the peg in and I made these guns anyway that I could you could like shoot with elastic bands and um, I brought it into school one day and then one of the lads wanted one of them so I I I made one and brought it back in so now I had a business and, yeah 20, and, 20 quid for that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Jesus if I was charging that I, I would have had plenty of sweets but yeah. um um uh, a few days later my mum <laughs> I got into the car and I was I was all upset and she goes um she goes what happened and I said I had to wind down the business <laughs> and she said why, why did you have to wind down the business and I said because I made everybody my employees and I had no customers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, but like, so I was just, um, as a kid, like that was a, an example of like, I was always making stuff and I was quite creative and I loved problem solving and, and I loved designing things and, and kind of problem solving. And then as a teenager, kind of in the face of kind of grappling with the dyslexia, I became quite diligent and um, um, deliberate, in terms of how I approach things and and I develop a certain work ethic and um and I think those things have stood to me really well you know and they're constituent parts of what we call resiliency you know mm-hmm. it's the the getting up and going again it's the trying again it's the it's the small incremental things that are kind of unglamorous and you don't see um um but just as important as those things which are kind of the you could call it like the rise and grind type mentality um, is also recognizing when I needed to rest and the value of that. Um, and often only in really understanding the value of that because I pushed myself too hard and felt felt the deficit of that. Mm-hmm. Um, Which and, we're all guilty of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, big time. And look, you only know your limits when yeah. you come up against them mm-hmm. and you recalibrate and um, just before this, we were talking about the importance of of scheduling in lighter weeks, yeah, otherwise yeah. they don't happen. <laughs> For um, sure, yeah. and and time off, you know, and the hardest part of working is not working. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're if you're in some way a business owner or mm-hmm. self employed, you know, and mm-hmm. um, it's so easy to to keep saying yes because you're wondering if the one time I say no is that when it all falls down, mm-hmm. um, and um, and so. All of those kind of were constituent parts of me that um, I suppose I developed during my childhood and teenage years. And and I think adventure was always important to me. Like I loved to hop the hedge and go exploring with the dog. And I had no problem heading off down the coast myself. Um, I was... I was quite adventurous, like as a young person. And I think that natural curiosity um, and the idea of being on an adventure has been something that's been really important to me. And like, if you, if you read anything about Joseph Campbell and this idea of the hero's journey, uh, again, we, we mentioned this earlier, but um, before we hit record, but the idea of the hero's journey is, is all about like saying yes to an adventure. And this has just been a very different form of adventure than I anticipated. And actually one of the most fulfilling things has been, for me, has been like finding new ways of of adapting equipment and myself so that I can get back out into the outdoor environments that were so inspiring to me always. And to, yes, do it in a new way, but in a way that um, once again, I feel engaged and on an adventure in those places. Um, and so, um, I, I think some of those pieces along the way have been important though, the, the sense of adventure and the curiosity that is a a part of that and the idea of being creative and innovative in, in different ways. Um, and, um, and then as a teenager learning that kind of maybe the diligence or the, the certain level of work ethic to, to there's times when you just have to put your head down. Um, and all of those. Um, have gone a long way in helping me um, mm. since that, that moment when I felt the click. Yeah. 
because it, before all that you had a lot of difficult challenges in terms of um, physically and mentally. You talk about having some anxiety around your your body image. Mm. Um, you talk about the dyslexia. Would the dys- dyslexia be termed as a disability as well, or is this I I don't know. It would certainly limitation be at least some, some yeah. form of learning challenge. But like I certainly wouldn't have considered it a disability. Like mm. like. But it is, a, it is a, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a different style of learning. Mm. Um, but if you look up very often, um, the lists of like successful entrepreneurs with dyslexia, you're, you're, you'll see all the big hitters on mm, there. True. Um, you almost, know. O- almost again, using that adversity to empower them. Yeah. More so and, than disempower. And like one of the things was that, um, I, because I struggled, um, with the reading and writing, um, parts of it at an early stage. Now I've, I've, I've become very comfortable with those now but it it i suppose pushed me to develop my my oral um communication skills mm-hmm. and um and that's really stood to me over yeah. the years you know um so i think you know every challenge has a reciprocal mm-hmm. um charm or or whatever you want to, to say or an opportunity yeah, yeah. um and, and I would definitely say that you mentioned the body image piece, like as a young kid, like I was a slim young kid in a big rugby school. And, um, um, I remember on one of the first weeks in secondary school, we were out training for, for a match and we had like great success, um, as a school when I was, um, when I was younger and we, we won the junior and senior cup when, when my year was in school and really high quality in our year and the year ahead and, and below us. And it was just a, a kind of a, a, a really good time in, in the history of the school. But um, I was in first year and I remember being out on this absolutely rough day, uh, lashing rain, uh, sideways wind, you know, all these these kind of um, conditions. And we were warming up for a match and I had my dad's all weather trousers on. And, um, like I was 13, whip it of a fella, like, and my dad's a fully grown man. So you can imagine these trousers are more than a bit baggy on me. And next thing the wind blows and it looked like a flagpole, like my two, <laughs> two legs look like flagpoles yeah. with the flag hanging off them. And one of the lads goes, oh, look, chicken legs, you know, and. Oh, you're chicken legs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah. I yeah. was called the same thing. So, so I, 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 I hear you. Yeah. I was like, well, <laughs> now lads. It's come true. <laughs> All those years later, I've finally grown into it. Um, yeah. But um, no, it's funny. Like, it, it's funny looking back. Um, but it's also remarkable. Like, that started and like that became kind of my nickname in the younger years in school. Mm-hmm. And that started a process of me being conscious of my body in a way that I never was before. This stick. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and... Um, I was always like a very naturally low body fat percentage and uh, lean and um, and as time went on, I developed like as you get into your later teenage years, you start to fill out a little bit more. But I was always very slim and um, had uh, that kind of lean body and um, um, God, like I had some awful like struggles with sort of certain clothes and the way in which my body pr- would present. And over time, I actually, whether it was conscious or not, I learned to really like myself and I learned to really like my, my body over time. But like that was a big journey. Um, and as I went, I was leaving school and coming into college, like I really liked who I was becoming as a person. And I looked in the mirror and I liked the person I see looking back at me and I was like proud of my body and I started training to take care of myself. And I li- I would have no problem in saying that that I liked looking well, like and uh, and all of those things. And, and they became really important to me. And then when I had the injury. And I lost control of 85 percent of my body. And you put on weight in all the places that you used to have muscle and you lose control of your your abs or whatever it is and and all of a sudden you've got a bit of a pouch when you sit down and your posture is different because you've got 
so little muscle control and even where you've got muscle control you've got so little definition or 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 tone because you've been lying in a hospital bed and you just become entirely deconditioned and the way my injury happened I had instability on one shoulder more than the other and so I looked like my ki- my shoulders looked like children's shoulders and um, they were they were so small and and um and everyone comes to visit in the year after you have the injury, you know, and everyone brings cake. And, <laughs> and so like in the year or two after, you know, my skin went to shit. Um, you know, you're, you've been inside for nine months in hospital, you know, um, you're not seeing the sunlight and you know, all those things start to play out. You know, your, um, your, whatever, your hair isn't cut and you're, you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, whoa, like, I, I don't know that person. And surely that, that isn't me, you know, and, um, and like, I have to say, like, w- some of the hardest things for me have been like, um, I used to kind of pride myself on, I had like big broad shoulders and, and like a decent chest and, and like, I, was kind of proud of of the work I'd put in and and then post injury like I lost muscle function or I lost the function of my chest muscles um I don't have tricep function so like my arms as much as I train I'm not going to see the body transformation and so it really shifted my mindset of like while I train and exercise first of all for self-respect because I and for mental and emotional regulation, like it's a game changer for me. Um, whether it's chaining in the gym or or getting out on the bike or whatever it is, there's that mental and emotional regulation piece. It's also like I have this idea of like showing up for yourself, you know. And for me, that's one of the ways that I show up for myself is like another way is getting a good night's sleep. Like give yourself the opportunity of good night's sleep and it takes care of most of the problems that you're facing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it makes everything a bit easier. Um, um, but like exercising for me is really important. And um, But I know that I'm not going to see the body transformation. But the thing that frightened me in the year after I had my injury was I went back for a checkup and I met, I was wheeling down the corridor and I heard this voice that I recognised saying, hey, Jack, Jack. And I turned around and I was looking for the person that was calling me. And I didn't recognize a guy that I was in rehab with because his body had deconditioned so much, so rapidly. He was almost unrecognizable to me. And it's a slippery slope, like after acquiring a condition like I had, you know, like there's the downward spiral that can happen so quickly mentally and emotionally and you you there's adaptive um behaviors for good and for bad and in the earlier years i was probably leaning on some some behaviors that if i stuck with would be would have brought me to a detrimental place over time you know like the overindulgence particularly in food um as a coping mechanism some way Mm. of having control Mm. or or a relief um, but at a certain point, like that was going to end up in, in a certain way. When I got back to college, I certainly wasn't drinking every night or anything, but like when I went out, I would go hard and I'd go hard because like I wasn't comfortable in my circumstances and, you know, you can almost joke about it, but like I remember one night, um, about two years back in college, I turned up, maybe three years back, I turned up at the door of the apartment with two girls and a security guard and they were like, we found him on the street. And and like, that that's a funny story, but that's also really not. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the months after that, and I think like in lots of ways, I was progressing really well during those years. Um, but And I was kind of on achievement overdrive. I felt like I had time to make up and, um, but at a certain point, and I still remember it, um, in the room that I had in, in college, I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, 
like if this continues this doesn't end very well and i was busy showing everyone that jack's all right but i had to ask myself honestly was he and there was a few more things i think like because acquiring a spinal injury like i did it influences almost every part of your life and you have to adapt and change in a lot of different ways now you remain the same person and you evolve in different ways over time but there was different parts that i had to unbox and like one of the big ones was like my body image and was like could i become more comfortable with myself again and um and so i still remember like i developed this little routine that i would do for the last two years in college every morning before i left the apartment and i would like get up and get my shower get get dressed and i'd strap on wrist weights onto my my wrists and just for like five ten minutes i would do like a little workout um i would do a whole series of like deep inhales and exhales punching the air above my head and um, i'd be swinging my arms um down by my sides and kind of shaking them out and it was almost like like just letting go of all all of the shit um releasing it all um getting a bit of movement in and the good endorphins and having that feel good natural release and probably the most important part was that i wouldn't leave the room until i smiled at myself in the mirror and and that sounds like it's, it sounds almost a bit trite like when i say it out loud but that was so important for me was you know like that bit of movement in the morning i was like i'm doing something for myself and it was genuinely 5 or 10 minutes but i was like i'm i'm setting a habit here um the bit of breathing like the this was ever before breath work was a thing like it became public like i read a lot of buddhism as i said um and i learned a lot about meditation and you know the active breathing practices and and so i'd be just doing like heavy breathing in and out just to upregulate my system a bit and um and then the shaking like you talk about shaking yoga and and sort of static dance and stuff like that now like they've become things um but ever before i knew anything about any of yeah. that i was just shaking it out you know <laughs> and letting go of stuff and and that's literally what i was doing and i was just like letting go of the shit mm-hmm. and and um i ended up um not drinking for the goods of a year um uh, shortly after that and it fundamentally changed my relationship with myself and i think that that was a big inflection point from for me um where i really started to respect myself again in lots of different ways and to show myself that by my behaviors and um and that's played out dramatically over time and you know now my body and my health is in in an amazing place relative to where it could be and you know you you do so much to stay in in reasonably good condition um because your body deconditions so quickly and so now that's played out in a way where i love doing all the, those things because i'm doing it for like jack today but i'm also doing it so that i can be out on the ski slopes or i can really push myself on the bike and go exploring with friends and family in in outdoor environments that i love on the bike when the weather is decent from spring to autumn and um and i do it because i want jack when he's 80 and 90 and whatever else to be in good condition and um and you know so i've invested in those lifestyle pieces um initially because i was rebuilding the relationship with myself not just because i was coming through the mental and emotional grief and all of those pieces um but also because i wanted to look at myself in the mirror and really respect the person i saw again and like i'm way back on that journey like i when i every now and then you catch yourself at an angle in the mirror and you're like oh. and you're like no i'm so far down this road i'm so far down this road and you catch yourself in the mirror every now and then you say is this really is this really like what's happened 
And then you think about, I'm living a great life. You know, I'm living such a good life in so many ways. And so I don't think those parts all ever leave you. Um, but you become on such better terms when you regularly show up for yourself um, and invest in your relationships and those kinds of things. Because like when everything else falls away, it is your health and your relationships that are the building blocks for that that are most important. Um, and so like they've been two areas that have been really important for me to continue to nurture over time. Mm-hmm. How did we end up here? Oh my God, we've we're That's deep brilliant. we're deep down the rabbit hole. We are. Well, <laughs> we love rabbit holes here, man. Yeah, let's let let <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Yeah, building blocks in terms of uh, relationships and people, and something you've mentioned several times before is that it's the environment that enables or disables you. And when I heard you say that, the question that came to my mind was, who were the people? that enabled or disabled you on your own path here or potentially continue to do so. We have this thing, I think, as a society where you may be going down the street, you're in this wheelchair, you you walk past someone and somebody throws you like a a sympathetic look. And although you don't feel like the victim, you feel empowered now and you feel stronger and more resilient and healthier mind and body, that sympathetic look could potentially bring you back into victimhood very quickly. I'd imagine now you can tell me. Um, and I'm often very careful from what myself, when I see somebody who has a d- disability that I don't transfer this pity onto them that I, you know, that, 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 that's a genuine smile of gratitude or appreciation, or I see you, I notice you and I wish you well versus, oh, poor you. So, how you begin? How did you navigate those challenges of the disabling and the enabling of people throughout your journey here? Well, look, I, I just think you can extrapolate this in so many ways. You know, if we're all born into the world, and depending on the family environments, the school environments, the the economic environment, the policies that the government you know it it plays out the environment plays out in so many ways around us and they either set us up to be you know as 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 you said um enabled or disabled they're either constructive or destructive in our lives um when i went back to college initially and i'm so happy i did that because you know it was a training ground for everything else that's come after because I was, I was very much in a place that I, I could metaphorically and physically like bounce up against things and try things. And when I fall, fell over, like it wasn't fatal, you know, I could get back up and try again or, or have someone help me back up um, as was often the case. And, um, but I realized when I, when I went back into that environment, you know, that there was a certain onus on me to make my scenario okay for the people around me. You know, because I I think so often it's fear that gets in the way of how do we, we don't know how to engage with this person of a different ethnicity or, you know, maybe their sexual orientation or preferences are different to what we understand or know or like it shows up in in any kind of difference, you know. And it's fear that often gets on in the way. And rather than fear, if we embrace the idea of curiosity, it was mentioned already today, um, and get curious about that person and how they live and where they come from. And, you know, um, then we understand a bit more and, and you realize actually we're more similar than we are different in many ways. And yes, I might have a slightly different way of doing x y or z or there's places and times where i need support and like but fundamentally we're we're actually maybe not that different than 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 you think and um so that that has been powerful but my i realized that i had a certain sort of responsibility to um maybe take that step first 
for people. Um, and, you know, I could let them into my world very quickly by saying, um, you know, people very often would wonder, does he need help? Do you like, um, um, what can he, can't he do these kinds of things? And I can just straight away say, actually, would you mind grabbing that door for me? Or, and all of a sudden I've let the person in and, you know, they're, they're now, into my world, so to speak. And and I think relationships fundamentally are built off trades of vulnerability. You know, it's like, hi, my name's Jack. Oh, hi, I'm Gav. Oh, I'm living in Sligo. Oh, no way. And all of a sudden we're trading bits of information. And the more we trade, the more exposed you are, mm -hmm. you know. Remo removes the barriers. Yeah, yeah. The, mo the more exposed you are and, and actually the more vulnerable you are in the trade that you make or the piece of information that you you exchange. Um, the deeper the potential for that connection to be or the the greater the risk you take mm -hmm. um, because it might not always be a recipro reciprocal experience, you know, and that that's where it's challenging. But um, um, for me, I've always found that taking that first step and, and sort of demystifying, so to speak, has been really um, a fantastic um way of kind of navigating um the difference that that i do have now and of of showing people how and when and 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 they can engage and you know i've learned a huge amount as well over the years about the barriers that do exist though and as much as i have sought to have people around me and i'm so lucky with the family that I grew up in and I have amazing friends and, you know, those friends have changed over time and I always think, you know, we have different people for different times of our lives and that's okay. We have to remember that that's okay and not hold on too tight sometimes um, or take the step to reestablish at other times. But I've been very fortunate fortunate with all, all of those people in my life. But what I have realised is that, you know, there's systemic things um, that often do disempower and disable people. And um, to a certain extent, it involves stepping out of the matrix um, to and taking a helicopter view to see how can you navigate around those sometimes. But what I realized at a certain point when I got a little bit of public profile was that maybe I've got a voice to talk about these things and you know I'm actually experiencing them myself as well um, and you know the more we level the playing field for people of difference um, the better in, in my eyes because like it could be any of us at any time you know and disability is one form of difference but like we're living in a country in part of the world Europe is very open in lots of ways climate is going to lead to increasing migration and like we see the ways that that has challenged people in ireland and and yet ireland have been the biggest migrants um to countries all over the world and um and and so you know these are these are all sorts of different ways that we are going to engage with difference and um the ways in which society publicly and privately is going to be asked to kind of entertain difference and um and see how can we level the playing field so that people can engage and so that it isn't surprising when the young man in a wheelchair owns and runs a business or or steps into the political arena or that we've got um um a young lady who's arrived here from ukraine and and now is is um medical doctor in your local town um, because she's taken the skill sets from somewhere else and, and brought them to where 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 you live or that, um, you know, there's a family that used to run um, uh, a bakery in, in Syria and all of a sudden they've they've opened up in Baligo, wherever, um, and, and they're serving the local community. And there's, I think that's going to be interesting over time. What's, what's cool as well in my eyes is that um, now more than ever, we're seeing representation of that, the various ways, I suppose, people with disabilities in particular um, 
are being shown in the media. And this started with like the Paralympic movement. Like I was so lucky that the summer I had my injury was the London Paralympics. Because I looked on and there was this brilliant campaign. So the, the Olympics finished. The Olympics finished and everywhere where the banners were um, for the Olympics um, were replaced with Paralympic um, um, banners. And it said like things like, thanks for the warm up guys. Um, and thanks for the warm up act or um, enter the superheroes. And that was the first really public um, way that the Paralympics was displayed. And people really bought in and they saw people that they previously would have deemed having disabilities and they were seen for the massive ability that they have and the ways that they're adaptable and, and creative in the face of change and the incredible things that not only they do with their body but like their mindset to take them to those places and they can too bring themselves to the raw edge of their capabilities and all these different things and you know, when when I got exposed to some of these, these are also people that, that have been living in society that maybe I wasn't as exposed to as previously realized. It was like, well, what are we doing in society to actually create a place where where they've got an opportunity to engage and they're seen f with all the same merit as everyone else? And um, and that's been a big part of my journey over the last couple of years is um, is sort of engaging and entertaining with that and, and trying to do right by by those people. And like if I put my health professional hat on again, it's like we're all going to age. And as that happens, we're all going to have diversity of ability over time. And so like what kind of health systems are we building? Are we building health systems that are are a place that's inclusive of that? Are we when it comes to transport, like, are we giving everyone an opportunity to get to where they need to go? When it comes to, you know, public services, like, can the person without sight engage with that? Or um, can mm. the person using the wheelchair reach the ATM or whatever it is? Not that we ever use an ATM anymore, but, um, you know, mm -hmm. um, I've started opening my eyes in a big way because I'm living it now and... I think that awareness um, has been something that's been quite a journey for me. And as I've gone on that journey and I've become more okay that I'm a part of that cohort, you know, 15% of the population at any time of disability. That's pretty big. Seen or or, or unseen, mm -hmm. you know. And um, when you realize that, it's like that's one in seven, mm -hmm. you know. And it could be any one of us. Um, I was like, when I became more comfortable that I was part of that crew, um, that I was, I was part of that crew too. Um, it kind of really opened my eyes in a big way. And, um, as, as I've been learning about it, I've been sort of seeking to let, let other people into that world as well. It's the acceptance piece of grief, isn't it? To, yeah. to get to that point, isn't it? Yeah. And that's been quite a journey to yeah. kind of get to that place and realize I can't only be focused on my developing my abilities, but I do have certain limitations. Mm -hmm. I do have certain limitations and there's ways that I need to adapt myself and the environment um, and, and hey, it's not just me, mm -hmm. but there's this whole cohort out there and Previously, they were shut away, you know, they were in the institutions and, and it's not that long ago. Mm -hmm, true. Yeah. It's really not. Um, and they were in the institutions, but now they're out in the world and they're all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's been really interesting to me. And um, we were just chatting before the podcast and like I've been really privileged to have the opportunity to work with the World Health Organization and um, and to be on the board of the National Disability Authority in, in Ireland. And I've had the opportunity to, to really do some interesting work in these areas. And um, you know what? People are just incredible. Mm -hmm. Like fundamentally, people are good. 
I think like if you're looking at the news, you can forget that. <laughs> but like 99% of the people that you meet and are day to day and are going about the world, like it is kind of remarkable that so much goes right. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a tiny fraction of things that people are, you know, get off the beaten path and things go wrong and that ends up in the news. But like, people are fundamentally good. It's been my experience. Um, people are willing to help each other. People want to see others doing well. Um, except if they're your best mate and you need to cut them down to size every now and then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like genuinely people want to see people doing well. And, and like, as we said earlier, the history of humanity has been like, adaptability and creativity and innovation in the face of change. And when you look around the world and look at it through that lens, you see it everywhere. Mm-hmm. And you see pro-social behavior and... Um, that's the narrative that's cool. the narrative you feed into again, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you had an opportunity to thank someone who has uh, been a significant influence on your on your health and your well-being to get to this point, who, who would who would that be? I got asked a similar question to that, to that before and I gave the answer which was um, Gavin Duffy and Orla Carmody. Um, Gavin's a businessman um, and, and Orla's a businesswoman. They're married um, and they, they turned up at my door and... Um, when it was in the months after I had my injury and I was home and they wouldn't leave until I recorded the application to do a TED talk. Um, Orla had helped me a little bit um, prepping for a radio interview I was doing and she said, you, you know, you've got, you've got a way of communicating and um, I think you should do a TED talk. I think you'd be really good. And and I was going through the depths of the belly of the beast at that time. Mm. And and I was pushing it away. And eventually Gavin just turned up and he said, I'm not leaving until you record this. This isn't about you. And that was so powerful. This um, isn't about you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This isn't about you. And I think that was really powerful when I look back. Um. I've thanked them before though, so they're not getting thanked this time. <laughs> um, I know they, 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 that was a really important thing. But I think um, someone else that I would, I'd love to acknowledge <coughs> publicly is like, look, my family have been remarkable and um, there's always like second victims um, in a scenario like, like it didn't just impact me, it had a big impact on my family and my friends. And that's often not seen and, and, I have so much love and respect for them and, you know, it influenced all of them in big ways. Um, but there was um, one person that that um, I spent only a couple of days with over my journey and it was in about uh, 18 months after my injury, I met this guy in a physio studio called Prime Physio in, in Cambridge uh, called Andy Galbraith. And I arrived into this studio um, to do physio for a couple of days. And I was met by this ex-military Scottish guy. And um, he understood that I used to be an athlete. Like, I used to be into training. And and everyone that I'd met over the first couple of months had kind of wanted to wrap me up in bubble wrap. And he said, no, you're more capable than you think you are. And I said to him, I want to work hard this week. And he bloody worked me hard. And it was the best thing because, again, the stories are sticky. Mm-hmm. And the story he he helped me realize was your body is one unit. You need to train it uh, all, even the parts that don't function the way they used to. You need to train it all and respect it all. Um, you're more capable than you think you are. Um, and... Um, and, you know, you can really push yourself. And that was really important. He was like, you, yes, you need to rest, but like you're 
far more capable than anyone will give you credit for. Um, and and this injury doesn't change that. Um, and so that was really powerful. And probably a third person that I would call out, and it was just something that he said, and he said it to my mum when I was in intensive care. There was the a priest um, in the hospital in Lisbon where I was in intensive care and he was a priest and he was a surgeon and he was the intensive care specialist. And, um, so he was like the, the chaplain of the hospital and he used to come in and check my vitals every day and he'd do the update or whatever. And he, he come in every day and I couldn't see cause I was in the bed, but apparently he had a different pair of runners every day and he had a big collection of runners. Um, but um, he came in one day and he said to my mum um, something along the lines of there are many people with good bodies who do nothing for society and that is bad. Um, Jack has a good mind and he will do good things. And it was kind of a broken English translation Um but he was, I don't know whether I couldn't speak at that time. He was seeing something in my eyes. We had this way of kind of predictive texting where they would point to, um, they had printed out an alphabet and they would um, point to the different words and I could make words that way while I was on the ventilator. Um, and, and one of my greatest breakthroughs was when I managed to tell them that that was the Portuguese alphabet and it was missing <laughs> letters that are in the English alphabet, so I couldn't, I couldn't bloody spell certain words. Yeah. Um, but um, whether it was through a brief couple of conversations with that, that he saw something, I don't know what it was, but that was um, another important moment. It was like you're more than, you're more than just your body. Mm -hmm. um, but over the years. I have reclaimed that relationship with my body as well. And we know now like the mind body can't be separated and um, that science is just irrefutable and it's so fascinating. And it's why I love investing in my body as well. And it, and it gives me a huge amount back. But um, I think they're kind of three people that I would sort of thank, I suppose. Amazing. And uh, Jack, I want to thank you for coming here today and for also putting yourself out there and this um, instant you could have easily just hidden away and kept to yourself and lived your own life but you're using it to empower others and to uh, give them hope and inspiration be it with a disability mm -hmm. or be it with, uh, with difficulties in their own life and 100% you have helped so many people and will continue to do so and thank you for that and uh, that comes from the heart, man. And uh, for everyone listening to the podcast today, please do them all a, a favor uh, and let them know where they can find you, reach out to you, and, and uh, of course, follow your journey going forward. Um, yeah, well, look, I would completely echo what you said, like what you're doing here with the podcast and, and all of the work that you do outside the podcast, Gav, like you're... Um, you're a leader of, of men and, and, you know, not just men, you know, I think, um, lots of, lots of us are, are, and at different stages lose our way. And, um, I think a lot of what you have represented and even through this podcast and, and, and the rest of your work you're doing, it's, um, giving people an opportunity to re-engage and remember their worth. Massive, yeah, self-worth. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and to know that they matter, and mm -hmm. they do, and you do, whoever you are listening. Um, so look, if you do want to reach out, um, I'm easy to find online, uh, Jack Kavanagh, IRL. Um, one of my mates um, regularly points out to me that that it looks like Jack Kavanagh girl uh, <laughs> is my handle, but it's Jack Kavanagh, IRL. Um, um is is my handle on most things and um yeah if you want to check out my website just do an L google search but it probably needs to be updated so 
Um, I'll see you on Instagram. <laughs> All good, man. I will add those uh, links in the show notes below. So go and check it out. And uh, Jack, all the best with your journey going forward. I look forward to uh, witnessing further progress and further impact from yourself. So thank you, my man. Cheers. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>